this is a special day, and uh, we honor all of you. We're going to look to the word of the Lord this morning, and uh, I want to read to you from the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew chapter 22, and I want to read to you just a few verses of scripture in your hearing. I'm so honored to be able to minister the word of the Lord this morning. I'm excited to hear Brother Elms preach tonight. It's going to be a wonderful time. Amen. And so uh, we're looking to Matthew chapter 22, and uh, I'm going to uh, begin reading at the 41st verse. And this is what the word of the Lord says. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? In verse 46, and no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Now this chapter, we're going to get into it a little bit, but this chapter is filled with questions. But after this statement of Jesus, no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth Ask him any more questions. And I want to speak to you on this subject this morning by the help of God. The answer to every question. The answer to every question. Could we just lift up our voices unto God and ask his blessing upon the preaching of his word. Lord, we thank you. We are nothing without you. Without you, we can do nothing. And I pray, Lord, that the word of God today would be quick and powerful and be that sharper two-edged sword lord pierce to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit help us i pray to hear to understand to receive to embrace to obey your holy word let it come forth with boldness and love let it come forth with accuracy let it come forth with compassion and wisdom we pray in jesus mighty name and everybody said in jesus name Everybody said amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Questions, questions, questions. Seems like there is no shortage of questions, and some seem to be perhaps more pertinent than others, but but when a question lingers, it is a little off-putting because we, we ask a question with the hopes of receiving an answer. And in fact, uh, that's the whole goal of a question is to receive an answer. As I mentioned, we are blessed now with two grandbabies and our oldest grandchild. She'll be three next month. And uh, she is entering into a new phase of asking questions. And, and she has these little what's and why's and how's. And, and uh, you'll answer the question and she will respond with repeating what you say with a little question mark at the end of it. It's kind of like, are you sure about that? And I know in about a year or so it's going to turn into... The what, the why, the how, and then you answer that one, and, and then uh, another question comes up, and you answer that one, and another question comes up. I remember when my girls were little, they, they asked a question, and I answered, and they asked another one, and I answered, and they asked another one, and I answered, and finally I got to a point, I, I, I ran out of answers. And I said, you know what, I don't, I don't know. I just don't know. And I remember they said, but Daddy, you know everything. And I thought, you know, they're actually, they're actually quite uh, perceptive, perceptive. And I, <laughs> they learned later that that wasn't quite the case. But at that moment, that's, that was their, their thought process. And, and so, it, but it's true that, that we run out of answers. We have questions. And inherent in the word question, the root of that word is quest. 
And it is just that. It is a quest for knowledge. It is a quest for understanding. We're trying to ascertain information so that we can satisfy our inquisitive mind. So we will ask questions, even when trying to get to know a person. You're meeting them for the first time, and so the way that you begin to engage them is by saying, what is your name? Where are you from? Uh, what do you do for a living? Uh, all of these questions, what are, you, what are you doing? You're on a quest. You're trying to get to know a person and understand some things about them. Many times, the more questions you ask lead you to an understanding that you may have some sort of connection, whether it be geographically or even through some acquaintance somewhere. It, it happens because of questions, questions. And they, the questions abound. And as you grow in life, the questions become much more significant as to what the answer is. The questions deepen in their meaning and even deepen in your need to have an answer. You're not just asking what is this and what is that, but you start asking that, that, that big three-letter word, why? Why? Why this? And why that? And why did this have to happen? And why are things this way? And so the questions become uh, very fast and furious as they approach us. I will tell you that the enemy of your soul relishes the opportunity to fill the vacuum of unanswered questions. And he wants to wedge himself in there and even maybe plant seed for questions. Wants you to start asking questions. In fact, the very first words that we have recorded of the devil uttering are in the form of a question as the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Uh, his very first words that we are reading about in the book of Genesis, he said, Hath God said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So immediately he confronts Eve with a question. And uh, it's interesting that we encounter that serpent three chapters into the Bible. And if I were to go around this room and ask, who was that serpent? I've already said it was the devil. But if I were to go around and ask, having uh, asked the question, who was that serpent in the garden? I, I would venture to say that the vast majority of people here would say, oh, that was the devil. That was the devil. But you know the book of Genesis doesn't call him the devil. Uh, in fact, the book of Exodus doesn't either, nor does uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all through the Old Testament. Uh, none, of, none of it calls him the devil. We don't find out that that serpent was the devil until the book of Revelation. When the word of the Lord says that old serpent, which is called the devil, that's when we find out who that serpent really was. So we encounter him three chapters into the Bible, but we don't learn his identity until 10 chapters, Revelation 12 we don't find out until 10 chapters who that really was. Why? Because God wasn't so concerned about what he looks like. He wanted us to understand what he sounds like. Because he can change his appearance. He can reappropriate the way he appears to you. He doesn't always come as a slithering snake in a garden. Sometimes he comes, Eve, the Bible says he can transform himself into an angel of light. And so you don't want to focus so much on what he looks like. He can come like a Delilah wielding a pair of scissors. You, you don't want to focus so much on what he looks like. You, you want to focus on what does he sound like. Because what he does is he tries to get you to question the word of God. Hath God said. And so I want you to understand that the enemy tries to fill the vacuum of those questions. But, but questions are okay. Questions are fine to ask. They just need to be asked at the right source for information. They, they don't, don't ask and entertain the enemy with your questions. You, you need to look to the Lord to answer your questions. He is the creator. He is the author. And he is the finisher of our faith. So look to the Lord to ask your questions. And you can ask God anything. In fact, God wants you to ask the toughest questions. There is no question off limits with God. You can bring any question to him. 
the real, the raw, the vulnerable, the difficult, the complex questions. In fact, the most complex question recorded in the scriptures was asked by Jesus himself upon the cross. My God, my God, why? I need answers today. Why hast thou forsaken me? And I want you to know there are some difficult questions that some of you have and they're lingering in the back of your mind. And the enemy has tried to fill the vacuum of unanswered questions. But I implore you today, in fact, I admonish you today to bring those questions to the Lord of glory. Bring those questions to the King of Kings. Bring those questions to the only wise God and Savior, Jesus Christ the righteous. Hallelujah. Kneel your knee before him. Open up your heart before him. Open up your mouth before him. Open up your Bible before him. And ask anything that you don't understand. I want you to know you'll come away from that experience maybe with an answer, most definitely with peace, and you will understand some things you didn't understand before that conversation started. Hallelujah. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your trouble. He will hear your faintest cry. He will answer. If not now, by and by, when you feel a little prayer wheel turning, then you know that the fire is burning. Just a little talk with Jesus. Just a little talk with Jesus. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. his name you don't always come away from that conversation immediately with an answer but when he doesn't give an answer he will give you peace that passes understanding and the only reason that you may not get the answer is that you receive from God line upon line line upon line precept upon precept precept upon precept here a little and there a little the answers don't always come the way we want them to come. They have to come in order. They have to come in the form of a building being built. You're asking for gutters and God's laying a foundation. Let God get you where he's taking you. You'll get the answer that you need in due time. Hear me now. He's building you up. He's, now this isn't some kind of us just slap it together and send it on out. No, he's building you up into a man of God into a woman of virtue. He's building you up a, a tabernacle for him to dwell in. He will answer in due time. It will come at the appropriate time. So you just ask away, pray away, worship, relish his presence, enjoy the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Know that what you don't understand, you will understand. There's some things you don't know, but there are some things you do know. And when you don't, when, you, when you're frustrated about what you don't know, take confidence in what you do know. There's some things I don't know about. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where it's going to happen. And I don't know when, and I don't know why, and I don't always know what or how. But I'll tell you what I do know. I do know that all things work together for the good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. I tell you what I do know. I do know in whom I have belief and I am persuaded that he is able. The revealed things belong to us. What you do know will give you confidence to face the uncertainty of what you don't know. And so you stand on what you do know and know that in time he will build you up line upon line, precept upon precept, and you will gain understanding. And Peter called it growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're not afraid of questions, even the toughest questions. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's as tough a question as, as has ever been asked. But notice how he asked it. He asked it while being nailed to the cross. Don't ask your questions while raging in the flesh. 
Don't ask your questions as Saul, King Saul did at a witch's house. Don't look to the mystics. Don't look to those in our world who seek and, and stand upon worldly philosophy. But look to the Lord. Let your flesh be crucified with Christ. Die daily. Be in a sweet hour of prayer. And you can ask God anything. He is not afraid of your questions. None of them. None of them. In fact, if you ask the wrong one, he'll gently lead you into asking the right one. He'll even show you you're asking amiss. Let me show you what you should ask for. And what he's doing is he's leading you into a particular path of righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. So questions, they come. And so I, 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 want, you to, I want you to understand that this book of Matthew chapter 22, this whole chapter is a chapter that is filled with questions. Jesus is being questioned by some ne'er-do-wells. In fact, uh, the, the Bible even says that the Pharisees took counsel that they might ensnare him and find out how to entangle him in his words. The Bible says they took counsel how they might entangle him in his words. And that's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to entangle God in his word. He wants to confuse you and I concerning the word of God. But I want you to understand something. There is nothing contradictory about the word of God. Even if something seems to be contradictory, those are the best parts because that means you're on the precipice of a revelation. You're on the precipice of a depth of understanding. If you'll keep on digging into the Word, if you'll keep just applying yourself to prayer and to the Word and bringing what you don't understand to your pastor and let the Lord speak to your heart, God's leading you into a place of understanding. But the enemy likes to entangle us concerning the words of God. So they took counsel. Now get that picture. They're sitting around counseling one another as to how they can entangle the Lord in his words. And then they approach him. In Matthew 22 and verse 16, this is what it says concerning them approaching him. They sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians. So the Pharisees' disciples... And the Herodians come to Jesus and notice how they approach him. Master. What? Wait a minute. Weren't you guys just in a boardroom discussing how you can entangle him in his words? And now you walk up to him and say, Master, we know that thou art true. You liars. I'm going to tell you, there's some people who will call him master. They will tell you they know he is true. They will open up this book that I'm holding right here. They will expound on one text after another. And they don't anymore believe that this Bible is the infallible word. And they'll disobey the parts of it that they don't think are convenient. Just because somebody calls him master doesn't mean that they follow him. Some of the worst serpents are those who come in saintly robes. Wolves in sheep's clothing. False teachers. And here they come to Jesus. Master, we know that thou art true and, and we, that you teach the way of God in truth. And you don't care for any man, for you regard us not the person of men. And they said, tell us therefore what? Thinkest thou, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? So we know that your kingdom is not a man-made kingdom. You're all about, you know, the kingdom of God and, 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 and what, what not. And you're not all into this man-made kingdom stuff. You don't care about the person of man or regard man stuff. So tell us, should we give tribute unto Caesar? Should we be good citizens to this kingdom even though we are a part of a, of a heavenly kingdom? Everybody heard the question and they all, you can hear a pin drop like you can right now. They look at Jesus like, what's he going to say? But the Bible says Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, you hypocrites. I love Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. 
I'm going to tell you, the devil may have pulled the wool over our eyes, but he doesn't pull the wool over Jesus' eyes. Jesus said, your flattery does not deceive me, you hypocrites. He said, show me the tribute money. Jesus literally said, show me the money. He said, show me the money. Show me the tribute money. And he held up a penny and said, whose superscription is this? They said, it's Caesar's. He said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are God's. Don't try to tell me that you can't be a good citizen while you're being a good Christian. There's no such thing as being so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good heavenly mindedness true heavenly mindedness is all about peace on earth goodwill toward men glory to God in the highest that's heavenly minded peace on earth goodwill toward men hallelujah hallelujah and the Pharisees walked away the Bible said when they heard these things they marveled and said left him and they went their way the same day came Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so they come walking up to Jesus, and they're going to tempt him on the resurrection. And I'm going to tell you, that's what the enemy really wants to make you doubt, is the resurrection. Because if he can, if he can somehow prevent us from believing in the resurrection of the dead, then we will live for this earth alone, and not for the, for the glory to come. And that's what the enemy wants. He wants you to live for what feels good to the flesh, the here, the now. He doesn't want you to live for what the Lord has prepared for you. That, that, that's, that's, that's his business. So the Sadducees come in trying to disprove the resurrection of the dead. And they said, okay, 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 all right. Let's, 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 let's say that uh, we got this friend and he was married and they never had kids. According to the law of Moses, if he dies and his brother is going to marry his wife and raise up seed, and if, and, and, but if he dies, no seed has been brought forth, and then the next brother marries the wife and no seed, and then the next brother, and they all die, and they all die, and they all die, and when you finally get to the end of these seven brothers, they said, whose wife is she in the resurrection? And that's what the enemy likes to do. The enemy likes to try to mock our faith. He tries to create some kind of a scenario where you would begin doubting the faith. But I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that the resurrection is the centerpiece of our faith. And so Jesus looked at the, scripture, at the Sadducees and said, you do err. You're in error. And I'm going to tell you what your error is, he told them. And I believe there's somebody here today, you're in error. And I, I feel in the Holy Ghost, I need to say to somebody, this is, this is where your error is. This is what Jesus said. You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. The issue is that you don't know the scriptures. And because you don't know the scriptures, you don't know the power of God. But the power of God. Is found in the scriptures. You Sadducees who think you know so much about God, you must have missed when Ezekiel was prophesying to a valley of dry bones. Hallelujah. And a holy wind from heaven, an east wind came into those, into those dead bones and they came back to life. You must have missed when Job said, Behold, I go forward and he's not there and backward, but I cannot find him to the left hand where he doth work, but he hideth himself and to the right hand, but I cannot behold him, but he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You must have missed it when Job said, though the skin worms destroy this body. He's describing the decomposition of the human body. When the skin worms destroy this body. Hallelujah. Yet in my flesh, I shall see God. I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand. He shall stand at the latter day. And you can go ahead and let this body decompose in a coffin. But in my flesh, in my flesh, this mortal shall take on immortality. In my flesh, I shall see God. Uh, 
you got to know the scripture. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound. Hallelujah. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. This mortal is going to put on immortality. This corruptible is going to put on incorruptible. Corruption. Thanks be to God who hath given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. I said, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. That's spoken in the context of the resurrection. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, hallelujah, that we which are alive and remain shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we shall be caught up, we shall be caught up, hallelujah, together with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'm going to tell you our biggest problem is when we don't know the scriptures. We fall prey to the unanswered questions when we don't know the scriptures. When we don't know the scriptures, we don't know the power of God. This is why when the enemy came in with his questions and the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, yeah, if you really are the son of God, that big if, if you are the son of God, then why don't you turn these tables of stone into bread? Jesus said, it is written. And shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. All right, here comes another question. If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down and let the angels bear you up. Jesus said, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Hallelujah. Here comes another question. If you be the Son of God, then just fall down and worship me. I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. It is written. I shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and him only shall you serve. You got to know the scriptures. I said, you got to know the scriptures. Hallelujah. I need, to, I need to tell somebody, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. Hallelujah. And my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid. Thou shalt not be afraid. Thou shalt not be afraid. Come on, somebody. You got to know the scriptures today. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Are you ready? Are you ready? Because here's what happens. The questions start coming. And we're starting, we're faced with this reality of these statistics say that, and these measurements say that, and these metrics say this, and if you put this and this together, then it can only equal one thing, and it always turns out to be to your demise and to your destruction. But let me tell you what the Bible says about your statistics. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Now you hear me, I can't answer for you and I can't answer for the thousand to my side or the 10,000 at my right hand. I don't know why certain things happen the way they do, but I'll answer for me. It shall not come nigh me. 
I'm standing on that word. I'm standing on the word. I know the scriptures. Therefore, I know the power of God. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee. I'm standing on that, Pastor. I'm standing on that. You can call it idealistic all you want to. You can call it unrealistic all you want to. And you live then with the consequences of how you interpret that. But I'm going to take God at his word. No evil shall befall thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. I'm going to tell you, plagues can be swirling around my head. Lightning can be flashing. Thunder can be crashing. But the word says, the word says, the word says, you do err not knowing the scriptures. You do err not knowing the scriptures. Open up your mouth and declare the word. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Bear thee up in their hands lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and upon the adder. The young lion and the dragon shall you trample under feet because he has set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer, answer, answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And I want somebody to reach up right now and grab a hold of this promise. With long life. Will I satisfy him? And show him my salvation. Our error is that we don't look to the scriptures. So we don't see the power of God. You, you Sadducees who deny, who deny the resurrection you do err, not knowing the scriptures, and you've deprived yourself of the power of God. Get in this book. Get in the major prophets and the minor prophets and the books of law and the books of history and the books of poetry and the Pauline epistles and the general epistles and the acts of the apostles and the gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the book of Revelation. Get in love with the word of God. And you will know the power of God. The Bible says a lawyer walked up right, right in the middle of the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Herodians. And a lawyer walks up and says to Jesus, said, okay, I got a question for you. Here comes another question. Here's my question. What's the greatest commandment? I think he really truly expected Jesus to say, wow. Oh, that's a tough one. There's a lot of good ones in there. I mean, they're all pretty good. I mean, I mean, thou shalt not kill. That's a pretty good one. Because we don't need to be killing folks. and Stealing stuff, that's bad. So that's a good. Boy, I tell you, that's a great question. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, here it is. Are you ready? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and him only shall you serve. You shall love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Hallelujah. And the second is like unto it. You didn't ask anything about the second one, but I'm going to tell you that the second and the first are connected. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the author of the law, the law in flesh. Hallelujah. The word made flesh said, upon these hang all the law and the prophets. 
They walked away saying, he has rightly said, it is the greatest commandment. But that's what the devil tries to do. He tries to get you to pick which one you like and which ones you don't like. You just discard those. That's what the enemy wants you to itemize it and compartmentalize it and say, that one's good. Oh, that one's real good. This one, I don't think we need to worry about that anymore. And this one, that's what the enemy would like for you to do. But, but that's not what it is. He said, love God, love your neighbor, and upon these hang all the law and the prophets. And then Jesus said, hey, I have a question for you. Uh-oh. I'm going to tell you, uh-oh. Two words, uh and oh. When God starts asking questions, he is not seeking information. He is dispensing revelation. Some of you are finding yourself even right now under the questioning of God. And you can feel the pressure of heaven to come up with a response. And I want you to know that God is just trying to reveal to you something about himself. That you've never known in its depth and way that he wants you to know it. That's why God asks questions. Moses, what is that in thine hand? He knew what was in Moses' hand. He just wanted Moses to know it can turn into a snake. It can turn water into blood. It can bring water out of a rock. It can part a Red Sea. That's the only reason he asked him, what is that in thine hand? Jacob. What is your name? He knew his name was Jacob. He just asked him so that Jacob would confess it so he could change it to Israel. I, I, listen, when, when Jesus starts asking questions, it's, it's serious business. Who do men say that I the son of man am? He knew who men say that he the son of man is. He wanted to know who do you say that I am. And when they confessed who they said that he was, he could let them know who he is. It was always, it's always to reveal something to you, not to, not to give him some information he didn't have prior. So he said, I've got a question for you. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And those Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians and lawyers were stunned by the question. They're all looking at each other. It's got to be a trick question. I mean, I, what do you, you say? Son of David, 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 son of David. Son of David. Son of David. Final answer. And Jesus said, yeah, I thought, I thought you might say that. I thought you might say that. Then I have another question for you. If he's just simply, merely, only the son of David, then why did David say, the Lord said unto my Lord, and he said it under the unction of the Holy Ghost. He said it in the spirit, Jesus said. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David called him Lord. How is he his son? Now this is what he was telling them. He was saying, David said, the Lord said unto my Lord. These are not two different persons. This is a reference to God eternal and, and when God became a man. So, so when the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. This is a reference to God being manifest in human flesh. This is a reference to the Father becoming the Son. This is a, revel a, re a reference to I am that I am. This is a reference to the Lord our God. This is a reference to one God who inhabits all space and time, stepping into our world as a human being to take our sin upon himself. Hallelujah. I'm thankful today that the good shepherd is the lamb. I'm thankful today that the lamb is the high priest. I'm thankful that the high priest is the advocate. I'm thankful that the advocate is the mediator. I'm thankful that he's the root and the branch, that he's the beginning and the ending, that he's the father and the son. Hallelujah. That he's the rose and the lily. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So he says there's a time when God is going to become a man. And that man is going to take our sin upon himself. That God is also our mediator. One God and one mediator. The man Christ Jesus. And when that happens, David said he's our Lord. So 
David called him Lord. How is he only just merely simply nothing more than a great teacher and a long succession of David's sons? Nobody could answer a word. And nobody from that day forward asked any more questions. That was it. That was the end. You know what he was telling them? He was telling them, Jesus Christ is Lord. And they didn't have any more questions because there were no more questions to be given. There were no more answers to be made. It simply was established. Jesus Christ is Lord. They didn't have any more questions because this was the answer to every question. You ready for the answer to every question that you may have? Every single one of them. I'm going to answer every question you've got. I'm going to do it right now with four words. Jesus Christ is Lord. It's the answer to every question. And I don't know what questions you've got, but this is the answer to every one of them. Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, what are my test results going to show? Well, Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, what's going to happen to my kids? Well, let me answer that for you. Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, am I going to get through this week as I'm running short on money? Let me answer that for you. Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, I've got some symptoms in my body, and I don't know what that means. Well, I'll tell you what that means. Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, North Korea is acting crazy. What does that mean? Let me tell you what that means. Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, what about the mark of the beast? and the Antichrist and nuclear warfare. Well, that's an easy one. Jesus Christ is Lord. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Hallelujah. You hear me that at that name every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's the answer to every question. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord! He's Lord in the hospital room. He's Lord in the operating room. He's Lord in the courtroom. He's Lord in the living room. He's Lord. He's Lord. He's Lord. He's Lord. He is Lord. He is far above all principalities and powers. All things are subject unto him. There is nothing that you can face, nothing that you can encounter that he hasn't already overcome, that he hasn't already conquered. Sad one, weep no more. It is Jesus. It is Jesus. Hey, mom and dad, praying for that prodigal, Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't know what news you got last week. I don't know what you're fearful about happening next week. But Jesus Christ is Lord. Somebody lift up your hands right now and believe it. Once you settle that in your spirit and you believe it with all of your heart, it'll answer every question you have. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost moving in this house. Well, why did this have to happen to me? And why did that have to happen to me? You hear me? It, it doesn't matter because Jesus Christ is Lord. And he's going to restore the years that the locust hath eaten. And he's going to return to you the time you lost that the caterpillar has devoured. God, God, he is the Lord of all lords. He is the king of all kings. He is above all, through all, and in you all. Jesus, the Christ, is Lord.
Our musicians can come. You, you can remain standing. I know there's some doubters. I know there's some disciples in this place who, like Thomas, you still struggle with doubt. I've got to see the scars. I've got to see the proof. I've got to see the wounds in his side and in his hands. Jesus said, reach hither thy hand. Place your finger right here in my hand. Put your hand in my side. When Thomas saw it, he fell to his knees. It answered every question he had. All the doubt he was struggling with, it was all put to rest in that moment. He fell on his knees and said, My Lord! My God! You are the Lord that said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. God's getting ready to put some doubt to rest right now. God's getting ready to take your faith to a whole new level. I would to God that somebody would just break out in a holy praise. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I need some people that are waiting on test results to come down. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I need somebody that just lost their job. I need you to come forward saying, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I need somebody who's in the middle of a family crisis. Come on. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. The first place that we read in the scriptures, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord is my provider, is on top of Mount Moriah when Abraham was about ready to sacrifice Isaac and the Lord provided a ram in the thicket and he said, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord is my provider. It's a beautiful place in the scripture, but I want you to know that Abraham said Jehovah Jireh before that moment. At the bottom of the mountain before he ascended, he told his servants, the Lord will provide himself. He told his servants, Jehovah Jireh. He said, Jehovah Jireh, before he saw the deliverance, before he saw the mighty hand of God at work. Jehovah Jireh. Before he saw the ram in the thicket, before he knew God had provided. Jehovah Jireh. I wonder if there's somebody here, you feel like you're at the bottom of the mountain and all you can see is that steep mountain you have to climb. I want you to know he'll make your feet like hinds feet and set you up upon high places. He'll give you the ability to climb that mountain, but all the way up, I want you to declare what you're going to find at the top of that mountain. Jehovah Chira, Jehovah Chira, the Lord is my provider, the Lord is my healer, the Lord is my savior. Savior. The Lord is my deliverer. The Lord is my redeemer. And Jesus, 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 Jesus is Lord. Come on, that's it. Reach for him right now. As we lift our voices in song, reach for him right now. Reach for him. Right now. Yes, 
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Your name. Something's breaking right now. Something's breaking right now. 